Hello, and welcome back to our 2017 educational webinar series. I am Dr. Jill Brooks, Senior Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, a hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. Today we begin our March webinars, the first of five, focusing on contracts and compliance requirements. We are so happy to have Jennifer Gimler-Brady back uh, presenting for us again today. Uh, Jennifer is a partner with Potter Anderson Caroon. This, uh, she is an immediate past chair of the firm's litigation group and a former member of the firm's executive committee on which she served for over a decade. She currently serves as general counsel to the firm and concentrates her practice in the areas of health law, labor and employment law, and commercial litigation. She regularly advises long-term care providers, physician practices, and other healthcare providers on a variety of issues including licensing and certification, fraud and abuse laws, medical privacy and confidentiality, and litigation matters. Jennifer also counsels employers on labor and employment issues including unionization and collective bargaining, employee supervision, discipline and discharge, sexual harassment, and employment discrimination. Jennifer is a frequent lecturer on such topics as employment practices, fraud and abuse laws, long-term care litigation, antitrust law, medical records confidentiality, compliance under HIPAA, and medical practice management. Jennifer earned her law degree from the Pennsylvania State University Dickinson School of Law and a health law degree from Widener University School of Law. A copy of the handout is available for download in your control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel. At the conclusion, we will address questions at the end. Uh, your PACOM CU certificate will be emailed to you from PACOM following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the, the live broadcast. You'll have to check their website for further details. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, thank you very much, Jill, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, or perhaps good morning to some folks. Uh, I am uh, delighted to have the opportunity to chat with you today about uh, business associate agreements. And I thought I would start out by doing a, a brief refresher course uh, um, about HIPAA, what HIPAA requires, and how uh, business associate agreements um, come into play under HIPAA, then we will talk about uh, the, the structure of business associate agreements, required contents, as well as uh, some uh, optional provisions that um, folks may want to think about that covered entities may find advantageous to uh, include or address in some fashion in their uh, uh, business associate agreements. Then we'll switch to a, an update on the uh, HIPAA Phase II audit. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, Office of Civil Rights Audit Program that is looking at HIPAA compliance uh, issues and, and going out to uh, covered entities to determine whether they, in fact, are in compliance. Phase II audits are focused on uh, covered entities and their business associates. So. Uh, it is, uh, we're in, we're in the midst of phase two audits. It's uh, absolutely uh, a good time to be covering our business associate uh, agreement topic. And then at the end uh, of my presentation, I'm just going to touch on some recent enforcement activities by Office of uh, Civil Rights to give you a sense of the evolution of HIPAA enforcement, where we are now, and uh, quite frankly, some of the rather staggering penalties that uh, OCR is imposing uh, after a, um, uh, a honeymoon period um, I, of uh, OCR looking at uh, HIPAA compliance uh, from more of an educational and training um, aspect. We're now seeing um, the tiger bear its teeth and seeing aggressive enforcement with significant penalties and uh, other uh, uh, other sanctions being imposed. So we'll, we'll wrap up with that. So um, as you all are likely aware, HIPAA uh, does a number of things. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act accomplishes a, a number of, of things. But for present purposes, what we're interested in 
um, is the privacy rule and the security rule, um, both of which apply to covered entities. Uh, and we'll use that term uh, throughout this discussion. Covered entities are healthcare providers, uh, insurers, and healthcare uh, clearinghouses. Basically, folks who generate and maintain protected health information, or PHI. The security rule aspect of HIPAA applies to electronic PHI. The privacy rule doesn't distinguish uh, among the, the uh, types uh, or the manner in which information is maintained, protected health information. So privacy rule uh, uh, guidance applies to uh, protected health information no matter how it's maintained, if it's electronic, if it's written in paper, or if it's communicated orally, the privacy rule would apply. In contrast, the security rule only applies to electronic protected health information. And it's intended to set national standards to um, guide the protection of electronic information. And when I say guide, um, I, I think we all need to bear in mind that the security rule does not tell you you must have this technology and you must implement this um, particular type of uh, security measure. What the uh, security rule does is puts the onus on covered entities to ensure the confidentiality, the uh, integrity, and um, the availability or access to uh, electronic health information, but also to protect that information against wrongful access and use. Uh, and by wrongful, I mean unauthorized access uh, to, or, or use, or also to protect the integrity of the information, to protect it from being destroyed um, or otherwise lost, and to ensure compliance by the covered entity's workforce. Basically, this is a similar standard under uh, both the privacy rules and the security rules to maintain uh, a, a high level of training among your workforce as to appropriate handling of EPHI. So in determining um, the security measures um, to implement, there are a couple of, of guidelines. First of all, the security safeguards under the security rule fall into one of three categories. There are physical safeguards uh, specified in the rule, which uh, cover physical access to PHI, where it's stored, how is it secured, workstation station usage. Those are uh, standards that fall within the, the, the physical safeguard um, standard of the security rule. The next is administrative standards. Those are your policies and procedures to implement security um, uh, protections and to manage the conduct of the workforce vis-a-vis -vis, uh, PHI. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the last is the technical um, safeguard, and that is your access control and the actual manner in which the information is handled, protected. So that would cover things like encryption and audit uh, controls that uh, that's the, the tool by which you track access to PHI, how the information and the user is authenticated. Those things would fall into the um, uh, technical safeguards aspect of the security rule. And so when you look at um, which standards to implement, and each one of those, those safeguards has numerous standards underneath it, some are called addressable, others are called required. It's very simple distinction. If it says it's required, you must implement it. If it says it's addressable, you need to look at your organization and decide whether that restriction or that, that guidance is reasonable and appropriate to the nature of your particular environment. And if you determine that a particular um, uh, specification is not, you need to document why that is. Why is that say, uh, specification not appropriate to your environment so that you have that uh, type of audit protection? The fundamental aspects of the security rule are flexibility, scalability, 
and technology neutrality. And what that means is the rules are not intended, as I said at the outset, to be um, hard and fast. You must have this requirement or must use this technology. Rather, there's a lot of discretion uh, in the security rule uh, for uh, covered entities to decide what works best for their organization, provided that they're keeping in mind the overarching issue, which is to protect the, the security and integrity of electronic protected health information. Um, scalability is a concept that relates to the organization's size. What a sole practitioner physician office may do in terms of security implementation likely will not be the same thing that a major uh, urban health center would do, for example. And HIPAA does not require those two types of covered entities to be consistent and on the same page in terms of how they implement the security rule. Rather, they need to do what's appropriate to their environment and the nature and volume of information that they, they handle. <clears throat> and the same for technology. The entity needs to decide, the covered entity needs to decide what type of technology is appropriate for the organization. So that's a quick overview of the security rule. The privacy rule, as I mentioned before, applies to uh, protected health information no matter what form it is in. And the privacy rule sets, again, national standards for protecting health information. You may be in states that have rules regarding um, uh, disclosures and protections and confidentiality of medical information. And the general idea is you might have heard about preemption. Uh, the general concept is that if HIPAA is more stringent in terms of its requirements than the pertinent state law, then HIPAA preempts or takes precedence over the state law. If the state law adds more protections than HIPAA, then the guidance should be to state law and you should follow your, the, your particular state law if it's more stringent than, than HIPAA. But the idea is uh, under HIPAA was to set kind of national guidelines for the protection of uh, confidential medical information and to have consistent standards that uh, covered entities apply to the handling, the disclosure, the use, the sharing, uh, and, and um, any changes to um, the, the uh, protected health information. Um, Key among these issues, I think, are to uh, you know implement safeguards that limit access to the most uh, to the uh, people who are in the need to know zone, and also to the minimum extent necessary to accomplish whatever uh, task or issue or or diagnosis, treatment, what have you, is is um, that needs to be accomplished. So perhaps if you're um, using the, the uh, idea of uh, operating on somebody's gallbladder, uh, chances are you don't need to have access to their psychiatric history uh, information. Um, and so uh, HIPAA has with, built within it a minimum um, necessary concept where you don't give more information than is necessary for, to achieve the, the purpose at hand. Um, key is, uh, in, in the privacy rule, is that there's an obligation on the part of uh, covered entities to ensure that service providers who provide type, various types of services for them that might give them access, uh, the service provider access to protected health information, that um, there be a, a, an agreement in place with that service provider that addresses how that information is to be handled. And we're going to get into some detail about that shortly. And uh, like the security rule, the privacy rule expects covered entities to implement training and uh, regularize training on programs that uh, uh, educate folks on how to protect confidential health information. And as we know, HIPAA violations, if you don't follow the rules, can result in civil and criminal penalties. So a little later, after HIPAA, HIPAA was in the 90s, um, the High Tech Act came along, and it's really to refine HIPAA in a number of respects. Um, key among the High Tech Act um, 
development would be the provision that requires HIPAA security and privacy rules uh, and, and extends them to through covered entities to their business associates. Before, if you had a business associate agreement, the business associate agreement is not a new concept. That was in the original HIPAA legislation. But essentially, the liability for a HIPAA violation still stayed with the covered entity. Uh, so if your, if your business associate um, uh, had a breach um, that gave somebody access, unauthorized access to PHI, the covered entity was this one still on the hook. They might have contractual uh, remedies as between the covered entity and the business associate, but OCR couldn't go after the business associate for the breach. They would start, the buck would stop with the covered entity. Under the High Tech Act, that's no longer the case. And business associates can be as liable, uh, if you will, for a HIPAA breach as a covered entity. The High Tech Act also addresses uh, notification of the subjects of PHI when there is unsecured access to, uh, I'm sorry, when there's access um, to their unsecured information that's wrongful access when the security is breached, there are notification requirements. There are restrictions on disclosures and sale of health information. Um, there, is, uh, there are some changes about, or uh, refinements would be a better term, about accounting for um, protected health information disclosures. And again, you see the importance of educating and training covered entities, business associates, as well as individuals on the uses of um, and the security requirements for protected health information. And uh, importantly, high tech provided for enhanced HIPAA violation penalties. After the High Tech Act was passed, there was significant rulemaking activity. And ultimately, we wound up with an omnibus final rule that was uh, put in place in 2013. That increased civil penalties uh, for HIPAA violations for up to a 1.5 million uh, per year uh, will, um, uh, penalty for willful neglect. What you see there is an intent. HIPAA penalties uh, are and, and how significant they are. Uh, one of the factors is the intent of the individual involved, and uh, willful neglect. It tends, and the more significant penalties tend to be associated with situations where the covered entity or the business associate, if, it's, if that's applicable, was actually on notice of the potential risk of um, a uh, security incident or uh, on notice that a uh, information was not properly secured. And in those cases, OCR seems to take particular uh, ascribe to, uh, particular significance to the fact that you knew you had a risk, but you didn't implement safeguards to protect it. And when we go through a couple of the more recent enforcement actions at the end of the presentation, you'll see that theme in play. On the criminal side, where you're going to see the most significant uh, um, uh, criminal penalties are where you have individuals who had a malicious intent when they accessed the information and that they did so for personal gain. So those folks who are accessing PHI to, uh, for the purposes of either selling it uh, wrongfully to perhaps a criminal uh, enterprise or to engage in uh, identity theft um, uh, in them themselves. And those, that's where you're going to see significant um, uh, penalties, criminal penalties under HIPAA. So some of the guidelines, again, in terms of when, when they're looking at what kind of penalty to enforce and, and the degree of the penalty, they're going to look at the nature and the extent of the violation. Was one person's in, uh, PHI compromised or 20,000 individuals? Um, they're going to look at the nature and the extent of the harm resulting from a violation. A, uh, security breach that discloses uh, perhaps, say, an address only would probably not be viewed as, as 
significant as a situation where you have um, social security numbers and other identifying information, birth dates, that type of thing. When that information uh, is provided or access that certainly raises the specter of, of more significant harm. They're going to look at prior compliance, including violations by the covered entity or the business associate. If you're a frequent flyer, you can expect that you are going to have enhanced penalties assessed for, for a security breach. Uh, they'll also look at the financial condition of the, the covered entity or the business associate to gauge whether the penalty that they're considering could be, um, uh, you know, put the entity at risk uh, for continued uh, viability, and then other factors that uh, that strike them as important at the time. Other things that uh, the High Tech Act did was were um, to expand the rights of individuals to restrict disclosures of PHI and also to prohibit the sale of PHI without permission. So uh, you cannot, uh, entities that gather and process and, and obtain uh, PHI uh, and, and manipulate it in particular ways, they are not at liberty to sell that information without having expressed permission um, from the subject of that, uh, that particular PHI. And then the other rulemaking under high tech was the breach notification uh, final rule, which requires um, uh, individuals to be notified if their PHI was unsecured and it was accessed. So this, when I say unsecured, I mean in information that's not rendered unreadable or indecipherable through encryption or some other technology. Um, if there's an a, a wrongful access to that information, there is a notification requirement. And then I address for for significant breaches of 500 uh, of more than 500 individuals, there are certain enhanced notification requirements. So let's talk about business associate ag uh, agreements and some of the basics and and key provisions that you want to make sure your uh, business associate agreements contain and some other provisions that you may want to consider. Under HIPAA, a business associate is any entity that essentially serves, uh, provides a service to a covered entity that affords that, that third party access to PHI. Some examples I, I've included are a third party administrator, payroll vendors, um, medical transcriptionists, uh, attorneys, uh, accountants, pharmacy benefits uh, managers. I think sometimes folks forget about their attorneys and, and perhaps even their accountants because there are independent privileges that apply to interactions with those folks when they are your um, uh, fiduciary and they're your accountant and, you, or, and have an accountant privilege or an attorney-client privilege. But in addition, that's not enough to protect you under HIPAA. So if you're providing PHI to your attorneys uh, in order to help get legal advice on particular matters of concern. You're going to want to make sure that you have business associate agreements in place with, with them as well. A business associate also could include any subcontractor uh, of your business associate. So as we'll discuss, an important provision in business associate agreements uh, is that your uh, that that your business associate, if they're if they're entering into subcontracting arrangements, that they put on that subcontractor the same obligations that they have to maintain the confidentiality of PHI and protect it as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the BAs are now directly liable, like covered entities, for compliance with uh, HIPAA standards and requirements under the security and privacy rules and are exposed to the same penalties for violations. So the privacy rule clearly authorizes covered entities to go to third parties to get assistance with things that they need to do to run their businesses. As long as the covered entity receives satisfactory assurances that that third party or business associate will only use the information for purposes of the engagement and for no other purpose. 
that they will safeguard and protect the PHI when it's in their possession uh, and protect it from misuse. And they will also assist the covered entity in complying with its obligations under the privacy rule. So HIPAA expressly uh, sanctions or permits the use of business associates. And the satisfactory assurances aspect has been uh, um, reflected in requiring a writing in the form of a contract or an agreement that has commonly been referred to as a business associate agreement. Now, a business associate agreement is not required for every entity, every service provider, uh, every business with which a covered entity uh, does business. Um, if you're working with an entity for services or functions that don't involve the use or disclosure of PHI and they're not going to have access to PHI or if they did it would be incidental at best, a business associate agreement is not required. I do know of some covered entities that err on the side of caution and essentially submit business associate agreements to any entity uh, with which they contract for services um, so that they are protected, and I can't argue against that. It's a, a little bit of a belt and suspenders approach, but it's not required. So, for example, if you are running uh, or own a medical practice or um, you know a, a major healthcare campus, for example, and you have a contractor, a landscaping contractor that does all the external maintenance you don't need to have a business associate agreement in place with that contractor in the, it, it, where you have a situation where access to PHI is highly unlikely. Um, and it, it, if there is any, it would be incidental at, at most. So that, that's an example of a situation where you wouldn't need to have a business associate agreement in place. But where you do, Business associate agreements should address some important things, and, and these things are required under HIPAA. Uh, you are required to address the permitted uses of PHI by the business associate and address the minimum necessary requirement, and we talked about that earlier, that it, they will use the information uh, and, and the minimal amount of information of PHI required to accomplish the goal of the contract uh, or the goal of the engagement. There should be a restriction on use or further disclosure other than is permitted um, <clears throat> by the BAA or is required by law. And there are some exceptions where uh, into, uh, entities can use PHI uh, for purposes other than the agreement for certain law enforcement uh, um, purposes, for certain public health purposes and also in some circumstances uh, to defend themselves uh, against a, a claim of, of malfeasance or malpractice, something like that. Um, there, the uh, business associate agreement should also address the, appropriate, uh, the use of appropriate administrative physical and technical safeguards, which we talked about earlier, to ensure that uh, non-permitted use or disclosure of PHI is protected against. The business associate agreement should contain notification requirements that in the event of, of a breach or security incident, the business associate is going to notify the covered entity and together work on any notifications that are, re that are triggered to either individuals or if you have a mass breach, uh, the notifications required to the media and to the Office of Civil Rights. The obligation to make PHI available for access uh, amendment and accounting of disclosures. Those are your typical obligations under the uh, privacy rule where individuals have the right to access their own PHI, to amend it if appropriate, and they're entitled to an accounting of all disclosures made of their, their uh, PHI. Uh, the business associate agreement should also deal with the return or destruction of information upon termination of the engagement and that uh, provide that in the event of a material uh, violation of the BAA, that the BAA will terminate. 
and a material violation likely would be uh, that information is not being handled appropriately, the PHI is not properly secured, or that there was a major security incident. Uh, the, P the business associate agreement should address the limitation on remuneration for PHI. In other words, uh, going back to the high tech requirement uh, or prohibition on selling protected health information without the consent of the subject of the information. Um, there should be a notice that there's a requirement that the BA make its internal practices and records open to review by the Department of Health and Human Services, or OCR, and the covered entity to make sure that uh, the, the handling of the PHI is compliant with, with HIPAA guidance. And an acknowledgment that the BA is liable for breaches and penalties, just like the covered entity. You want them to be fully aware and, frankly, have some skin in the game now, they would anyway, whether there's an express undertaking in the business associate agreement, but I think that this is an important provision to place that the BA on clear notice that uh, they will like, likewise be on the hook for any uh, damages that flow from a, a security incident. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the importance of, of noting that subcontractors, if the BA is going to use any subcontractors uh, for purposes of the engagement, that the subcontractor must first agree to be bound by all of the same requirements that apply to the business associate. The Office of Civil Rights website has uh, sample uh, business associate agreement uh, provisions online, and I've uh, included in the slide the, uh, the, a link to that website and to those sample provisions. They do not constitute an entire business associate agreement. Rather, they are just sample provisions that you can drop into the framework of an agreement. But uh, for some folks, they can be quite helpful or at least a starting point. Uh, for some of the key things that you want to have in a business associate agreement. As I mentioned, use of the OCR language, the sample provisions, is not required for compliance as long as your business associate agreement otherwise addresses the required contents. And um, I, I highlight this issue again about being aware of any state requirements that may differ or be additive. Certain states have very comprehensive uh, medical privacy laws, medical information privacy laws. And so to the extent that your state may impose an obligation that is more stringent than HIPAA and a disclosure may uh, be required or triggered for your BA, make sure you're aware of any, of, uh, any applicable state requirements. And be mindful that, that BAAs are subject to negotiation. After all, they are contracts. And so um, I, I know of you know, certain instances and in, in where people perhaps or en covered entities have greater uh, bargaining power. They may take the view that their BAA form is a take it or leave it form. And so their business associates feel very restrained in terms of being able to negotiate other provisions. Uh, but where you ha perhaps have a, uh, a, a contract among equals, there, these agreements can be subject to extensive no negotiation, and particularly with some of the additional provisions, that the add-on provisions that I'm going to talk about next, these are often subject to uh, quite intense nego negotiation. For example, cyber insurance. Uh, this is a really important topic. It's, on, it's at the forefront uh, because of the very significant uh, data breaches that we've heard about, not just in the healthcare space, but in, uh, in the uh, retail space and in financial uh, institutions. So um, more and more you find uh, entities, in, including law firms, obtaining cyber insurance um, to uh, you know, give it some added, give the entity some added protection in the event of a security breach and and the damages that can flow from that, and that's because most comprehensive general liability policies don't cover those kinds of losses. 
And so one of the topics for a business associate agreement, and, and uh, as a covered entity, uh, the covered entity needs to give extensive thought to this, is whether they, the BA should be required to have uh, uh, coverage in place that would respond to first and third party losses in the event of a, a security incident. And being mindful that not all cyber policies are created equal. Uh, obviously, you can get varying degrees of coverage, and you may have a policy in place that the, the coverage limits are so low that they're not going to be particularly useful in the event of a breach. But um, uh, you also have other provisions, breach response, defense costs, penalties, damage to the actual data systems uh, themselves, and business interruption that can flow. Those are all issues that uh, you should evaluate in, in terms of your coverage. Um, we also um, have uh, to keep, be mindful of the fact that healthcare information is provides a treasure trove uh, for someone who's bent on identity theft or selling it to a, an, an organization that, that might have a nefarious purpose in mind. And business associates are a top target because of the nature of the information they, they have access to. And so I, I highly recommend that, that the, the cyber insurance issue be vetted carefully. Um, Independent contractor status, you, you see that a lot addressed in a business associate agreements. Just making a clear statement that the covered entity does not maintain control over how the business associate is doing its work and that the business associate is performing as an independent contractor and not as an employee of the uh, covered entity. Indemnification, this is probably the, uh, the most intensely negotiated issue because the covered entity is going to want a provision that uh, indemnifies it in the event that the business associate is exposed to a security breach. And of course, the b business associate wants to limit its liability and its obligations to the fullest extent it can. So this is often a very uh, intensely negotiated provision. Uh, any kind of limitation on liability, again, something that the business associate would typically want to have is limited exposure to liability. On the other side, the covered entity is going to want the business associate to be on the hook to the fullest extent possible. Uh, also provision about no third-party beneficiary, the contract or the business associate agreement is between the two entities uh, and no one else can claim status as a third-party beneficiary. And then there may be particular safety um, uh, you know, security safeguards that you as a covered entity want to ensure that the business associate has in place, such as encryption. We'll see in some of the enforcement actions that there have been a number of uh, enforcement cases involving unencrypted data that was on a cell phone that, or a smartphone that was on a, uh, a laptop, and um, uh, OCR doesn't look kindly on that. So that may be a topic to address in your business associate agreement. Another is offshoring provision, uh, where there could be a representation that the business associate will not enter into subcontracts for services with a non-US entity or an offshore entity without the uh, advanced approval of the covered entity. Um, and that is because uh, you lose a degree of control. And there's an ongoing uh, you know, question as to whether that entity uh, that, that offshore entity could fall within the jurisdiction of the United States for enforcement if there is a breach. Um, access to BA's premises for audit purposes, um, that is to determine compliance that you, as a covered entity, want to reserve the right to access your BA's uh, physical premises so that you can audit their, particularly their security processes and make sure and satisfy yourself that the PHI that you're giving the business associate, associate access to is being handled appropriately. And of course, there's usually a provision that the business associate is permitted to use PHI in the performance of its management and administrative functions.
Turning to the audit program, we're uh, phase two of HIPAA's, um, OCR's HIPAA audit program is underway. It began this summer when a number of covered entities were selected to participate in HIPAA desk audits. And one of the big uh, pieces of information that was requested of those audits was an identification of all of the covered entities' business associates. That then led to the commencement of business associate um, uh, audits in the fall. Um, as I mentioned, the target is two to 250 uh, uh, audits, most of which are, will be desk audits, although CR reserves the right to do uh, comprehensive on-site interviews. There, are, there is an entire audit protocol that is available on the OCR website, which gives you an indication of what they're being, what an audited entity is um, going to be reviewed against in terms of the criteria. And of course, these notices that have been sent out um, do require extensive documentation to be provided, including uh, information about your policies and procedures to demonstrate, again, HIPAA compliance. OCR expects to complete uh, most of the desk audits, uh, expected to complete them by the end of the year and then use the early part of this year for on-site audits. I have not heard of an on-site audit of a business associate yet, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, and the idea is that OCR is intending to issue draft findings from this audit process, again, to use as an educational tool. Uh, but also uh, you can't rule out the possibilities that findings from the audits will be used for uh, uh, enforcement actions down the road. Um, I've included in the materials some recommendations for how to get ready for a HIPAA audit. And, you may not think that that's particularly pertinent because of where we are in the audit process. Well, OCR is not going to shelve this audit process for one thing. But the other issue, these are all really kind of common sense recommendations about periodic reviews that you should be doing of your HIPAA, HIPAA protocols anyway because they will also help you with incident response in the event that you do have a security incident. And so making sure that your policies and procedures are current and up to date and are assembled in one location, that's just good, good practice. Um, always thinking about how if you were asked to demonstrate that you're complying with the privacy and security rules, how would you go about doing that? What would you look at? Um, are you training your folks regularly? Do you have clearly identified privacy and security officials? Are you doing risk assessments? This is really, really important of your information systems. Um, and again, I have put um, a, a reference to um, OCR security risk assessment tool, which is a helpful um, guideline to follow when you're looking at your own system. What you're looking for are vulnerabilities and weaknesses, but don't just identify them. Make sure that if you have weaknesses that are identified, they're, they're fixed or addressed. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, with regard to enforcement, you can get uh, hoisted on your own petard, so to speak, if you have a report that says, hey, you should be encrypting all of your laptops. And that report was from 2010. And here we are in 2017, and it still hasn't been done. Um, and we've talked about um, uh, the security standards that are address addressable. Doesn't necessarily mean they're optional. You really have to look at whether they're reasonable and appropriate to the size and structure uh, of your organization. And the key is the documentation. If you've made a decision that something isn't appropriate for your organization, do you have documentation to back up your analysis, especially if you choose not to implement a particular um, uh, uh, implementation standard. Make sure you have your uh, readily accessible list of all your business associates and make sure the agreements are up to date and that they have all the required terms and of course you know things can change quickly and at any time there could be an additional uh, issue that, that HIPAA says business associate agreements should address so uh, provide for amendment if appropriate. 
and then have an incident response plan in place in the event that something untoward does happen and PHI becomes uh, exposed. So turning to enforcement, and I should mention, I know some folks had to drop off uh, because of the interruption and they had a hard stop. This is being recorded in its entirety and uh, this presentation, so it'll be available uh, to you if you need to peel off, and, and that's certainly understandable. And uh, uh, First Healthcare will make that available to you. A, a couple of points about enforcement actions. I just wanted to highlight the Catholic Health Services uh, case because this was the first enforcement action, and that's from the summer of, of 2016. It's the first enforcement action that OCR has taken against a business associate of a HIPAA-covered entity. And in that case, you had a service provider that provided management and IT services to nursing homes. And um, the, uh, a data breach was reported after a, a, a business associate employee's phone was um, stolen. The phone wasn't encrypted or password protected in any manner, and it contained information about residents of the nursing facilities, including their social security numbers, their names of their responsible parties, medical information about the procedures and medications, diagnoses, and other treatments for um, over 400 residents of the facilities. The OCR investigated and concluded that the, uh, that Catholic Health had not done an accurate and thorough uh, assessment of the potential risk and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality of the, the electronic information. And so uh, OCR assessed a uh, $650,000 civil penalty. And then, as is often the case, they, they imposed a corrective action plan that requires the, the uh, penalized individual to implement a number of different um, actions, often including training and risk assessments and regularizing those processes in their organization. Also last summer, Advocate had to pay a record fine, $5.55 million, to, re to resolve multiple uh, data, that should be data, not date, protection violations. Uh, there were significant uh, uh, in number of individuals whose records were involved in the, in the breach uh, that resulted from the theft of four unencrypted laptops. And um, also, uh, one of the, uh, the things that was noteworthy in this particular instance was that um, an advocate had failed to have business associate agreements um, uh, ensuring a so appropriate safeguards of its prior to disclosing information. So when there's a, an investigation, OCR won't just look at the issue of uh, the specifics of the, the breach at issue, but they'll look at the broad HIPAA compliance of the organization. And in this case, uh, it extended, the findings extended to business associates and the lack of effective agreements. In more recently, UMass, um, had to pay a $650,000 fine and have a, a corrective action plan when a, a workstation was infected with a malware program which resulted in access to uh, almost 1,700 individuals' PHI. This was the classic um, uh, uh, you know, uh, phishing email sent out and somebody clicked on it. Um, and it caused a massive, or led to a massive data breach. They did not have a firewall in place, and they hadn't uh, performed a security risk assessment prior to 2015. This incident had occurred in 2013. Uh, more recently, within the last month, OCR entered into another whopping settlement of $5.5 million with Memorial Healthcare. Um, that is a multi, multidisciplinary healthcare system, and uh, in that instance, 115,000 individuals' uh, PHI was impermissibly accessed by uh, health system employees and disclosed, wrongfully disclosed to an affiliated physician um, office uh, staff. 
and again, it, it's the, the key kinds of information, identifying information, names, birth dates, social security numbers. And what had happened there is that the login credentials of an ex-employee of the affiliated physician's office had never been terminated and were being used daily by others to access EPHI. And uh, this was one where I think OCR felt the need to send a clear message um, about the lack of an effective uh, compliance program. As noted at the, the last bullet point, a lack of access controls and regular review of audit logs helps hackers and malevolent insiders to cover their electronic tracks making it difficult for covered entities and business associates to not only recover from breaches, but to prevent them before they happen. So I think in that case, the OCR was sending a clear message of what the expectations are. And uh, again, more recently, another multi-million dollar CMP against Children's Medical Center of Dallas. Um, again, some of these go back uh, for uh, you know several years, but they get reported, then they get investigated. And this one stemmed from a 2010 um, uh, loss of an unencrypted BlackBerry, and with with several hundred or a few thousand individuals uh, PHI on it, and that led to uh, uh, a separate or, or not led to, but then there was a separate breach report about Festum, an unencrypted laptop with another 2,500 individuals uh, PHI uh, compromised. And although in that case they had some physical safeguards, we talked about physical safeguards earlier, to the laptop storage area, which required badge access and a security camera, the, the area was open to people who weren't authorized to access PEPHI. And um, OCR determined that there was another, uh, this was another instance of a failure to implement a, a risk assessment plan and in this particular case, there were prior um, third-party recommendations to the hospital to conduct such a plan. And there was a failure to encrypt um, uh, laptops and other um, uh, access points until 2013, more than three years after the initial uh, loss of data through an unencrypted BlackBerry. So again, another instance where OCR is sending a message, and I think that is clearly the theme. Um, if you look back over time in enforcement actions, um, there will uh, you will see that the the amount of penalties has has steadily increased. The dollar value of penalties, as OCR has taken the view that there has been ample time to um, uh, understand HIPAA, HIPAA's requirements, and to implement appropriate safeguards uh, for EPHI. So that is uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. Again, my apologies for the uh, the delay. I'm happy to um, take any questions that anyone may have. And uh, again, just a reminder that the presentation will be available in its entirety um, after its conclusion. Well, thank you, Jennifer. We do have a few questions, and uh, quite a number of people have stayed on, so we'll go ahead and address those. Uh, do we need to have a business associate agreement with other protected entities, such as physician offices or hospitals? What about our state HIE or medical software hardware vendors or cleaning companies that have physical access to a file room? Wow, excellent question. And in general, you do not need to have a business associate agreement with a covered entity if you are um, working on the same thing, so to speak. So if you have two physicians in different healthcare systems that are collaborating on patient care for a particular patient, you do not need to have a business associate. That is a privileged uh, discussion within the context of, of treatment, and it does not require any kind of authorization. Uh, it, it's a permitted disclosure under HIPAA, and it doesn't require a business associate agreement. However, if, for example, uh, a physician was um, asked to provide 
information to, say, a healthcare system for purposes of a data study um, that the hospital was doing, I think in that case, you may be getting a little bit more remote from the a protected or an authorized use. So in that kind of a situation, even though they're both independently covered entities, the, the purpose of the disclosure is not for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. So it would not be an authorized an otherwise authorized disclosure under HIPAA, I would have a business associate agreement in place in that kind of situation. So I'd be guided by whether or not uh, for covered entity exchanges of information, guided by whether or not the exchange of information would be for, for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations under HIPAA. If not, I would have a uh, business associate agreement in place. With the caveat that with the example I just gave about sharing uh, patient data, if the data that the physician would provide to the healthcare system for that study is all de-identified anyway, so there's no chance of linking a particular patient uh, to that data, then you probably don't need a business associate agreement because it's, it's not uh, individually identifiable information. But as a matter, just in an abundance of caution, I'd have one in place. The question about your, your uh, uh, cleaning company, in general, um, I would say uh, it, the answer to that question depends on how uh, fastidious the organization is about protecting uh, its PHI both physically, if they have it in hard copy or are having discussions on a telephone. Um, or with another provider in the hallway, and uh, how, how careful they are about their security um, uh, uh, safeguards with regard to their workstations and other, you know, if they have laptops and things like that, do they have timed shutdowns that if somebody's not accessing that or using that workstation or computer, it will automatically shut down, and then you have to have access credentials to get back on. The reason I say that is, is HIPAA only requires a business associate agreement if you're a actively being given access to EPHI if you're, or uh, PHI. If your access is only incidental at best, which I would normally think a, a custodial service would at most have access um, in an in a, uh, incidental kind of way, you don't need a BAA. But in my mind, and I tell my clients this, if you are not super fastidious about making sure that there are no patient files left open on desks or at nurse stations, or um, that if for some reason um, I could walk in to an unattended workstation and access your computers, um, you would want to have a business associate in pla uh, agreement in place with that custodial service. The fact that there could be two healthcare providers, two physicians, or two nurses talking in the hallway when a custodian, uh, custodial services person walks by and those two nurses are talking about a patient, um, I think that would be an incidental release. Um, but if there are other, if, if there, the likelihood that a custodial services employee could have access more than just passing to a PHI, if, if that likelihood is there, again, abundance of caution would say have a business associate agreement in place. Uh, our payroll company does not have access to PHI, only employee information. Am I correct to assume that we do not need a BAA with them? Uh, that would be correct. The, okay. the trigger is whether they have access to your uh, any kind of protected health information. If do, not, you, you have to have one in place. Do we need... You may want to have a confidentiality sorry. agreement in place. I'm sorry. I would just make that point that you may want to have a confidentiality agreement in place because uh, employee information is, um, uh, you know, protected under privacy laws as well. Not HIPAA necessarily, but the, you know the other other laws, and so you may want to have a, a confidentiality agreement in place that requires them not to disclose um, uh, uh, employee information other than it's required by law. <laughs>
And referring back to the first question, um, they clarified that for the cleaning uh, company, they would have to, uh, the file room is full of patient records, no patient files are left open, um, they'd have to intentionally pull one out and look. Um, you still, any comment on that? And then also the hardware software vendors. My, my risk averse nature would come to the fore on that. And if you are um, in having unsupervised access to a data room like that, where, you know, the, the, the custodial person could, could be in there and there would be no, you know, uh, office staff around, to make sure that they're not looking at something they shouldn't be looking at, I would have a BAA in place. That that to me is a is is a um, a real uh, uh, again to use that term treasure trove of of, uh, of information in that room. And I think um, uh, under the right circumstances, uh, OCR could look at that as more than incidental access. Uh, when you're you're putting somebody right in the middle of a of a data storage room uh, or a record storage room, mm -hmm. and they could at least theoretically have have broad access to confidential information, I, I'd have one in place in that case. And the hardware, software vendors, and state health information exchange. Hardware and software vendors, um, I would um, most definitely have. Uh, uh, one, a BAA in place if the nature of their work, you know, if it's an electronic medical record software package and, and they would necessarily have access to uh, electronic medical records, I, I would definitely uh, have a BAA in place. That, that would be uh, um, uh, absolutely required. If it's some other type of software where, or, or a, a hardware vendor for systems that would have no interaction with your electronic um, information or and in, in would not give them any access to electronic uh, PHI, I, I think you could you could uh, uh, forego a BAA in that circumstance, but if there's any potential access, you would want to have uh, a BAA in place. The healthcare, uh, the state healthcare information exchange, that's probably a protected release um, for purposes of um, uh, care coordination. I'm thinking of, and, and if I'm thinking of the wrong thing, let me know. But um, you know, where you're talking about a, a state health information network where providers throughout the state or who are subscribing to the network could have access to uh, patient information that's uploaded uh, to the the network, and that is for really a coordination of care and a, an improvement of care. Uh, I think that that's a protected release in that situation and all the covered entities would be uh, protected and would not require individual uh, business associate agreements um, among and between the members uh, who, who are participants in that, that network. If you're thinking, if, if it's something else, um, uh, you know, let's talk about that. But as I see it, that's an information exchange that's, that's designed to promote patient treatment and, and the quality of treatment, and I think that that's, uh, if you're dealing with all covered entities uh, as the, the individuals who would have access to it, I think you don't need to have a BAA in that case. Okay, we'll take one last question. Do we need a business associate agreement for reporting adverse events to manufacturers? So if that, uh, you're talking about a medical device uh, manufacturer, I would have I would have one in place um, if if it's something like that because they're not a covered entity independently. So if you are, uh, you know, saying uh, a hip joint replacement, for example, and if you're reporting an adverse uh, incident to the um, uh, manufacturer of that joint, and you're disclosing PHI about the individual, which you probably would if you're for reporting a serial number of the device or something like that, uh, I would have a BAA in place with the manufacturer. Okay. And could you make a comment on an expiration date, um, how long a BAA is good for? Um, it depends on the terms. Uh, you can make it um, as long, you know, if it's a long-term engagement, you can have it in place for um, – 
uh, however long you expect that engagement to apply. You'd want it to be at least for a year um, at a minimum. And then you can, uh, it, depending on how you draft the termination provisions or the duration provisions, you can have it automatically renew. If it's a if it's a year-to-year -year kind of thing where you want to uh, engage the services for a year but then have a chance to kind of uh, rethink whether you want to continue, uh, you can make it subject to renewals on an annual basis by just the parties providing uh, notice to one another that we'd like to extend it for another one-year term. So I think the answer to the question is it really depends on the nature of the engagement and how long uh, you all want to be um, under contract together, uh, but I would recommend at least a year, minimum sure. time. Great. Well, Jennifer, thank you very much. I think you deserve an award for pulling this uh, webinar off after that <laughs> situation. Uh, for the attendees, thank you for uh, staying on and I appreciate your patience. Uh, please join us again next week. We actually have two educational webinars on March 7th and March 8th, uh, both at noon Eastern Standard Time. First will be Understanding Your Medical Waste with Matt Jordoff of Choice Med Waste. And then on the 8th, Cybersecurity. HIPAA and state encryption requirements with Todd Sexton of Identelect Technologies. You can register for this, these webinars and also request a demo of our compliance solution at our website at 1sthcc.com or you can give us a call at 888-543-4778. Please use Jennifer's contact information on the screen for any further questions. Uh, the few questions that we did not have time for, I will send to her. Uh, and uh, if you send any more to us, we will forward them on uh, as well. Your Paycom C certificate and or index number will be emailed to you within a few days following this broadcast. Again, thank you very much for your patience and have a great day. Thank you all.